Could be running a few moments late. No, that's alright. Um, not in a rush. No. Um, Would you like water? Uh, thank you. Yes. Hello. Hello. Oh, yeah. nice to meet you. Sorry. Sorry. What's your name? Ali. Ali. Nice to meet you. They've done a great job with these guys. They've organised a really good tour. Um, yeah. yeah. Throwing water around the place. Learning a lot. I've been around a few years teaching in Barmer, in Kent. Places, but um, uh, a lot of this agenda, which are things which are new uh, to me, and certainly mm. the, the TTIP thing, is. Do you look at trade rules much at all? Well, we, we do. We had a. Um, uh, it's just like for our own program that we. There was a module on trade and the environment, so it's mm. a whole course looking at that. And, uh, okay. Otherwise, it's something which sort of fits in, um, I suppose, largely in relation to European Union matters. Um, I was not in the board late, we just said it, um, it's absolutely fine given that there are obviously some very good questions um, to eat in until lunch. So we can we can we, we can we can eat in by by up to ten minutes if if, okay. if, if need be. So we we you to start for God's sake at one night at, at twelve. Sorry. Right. So it might be it might be we go on a little bit. That's yes. really good. Did the list of attendees? Sorry, at one. Yes. Uh, at one ten. Yeah. Did the list of attendees material? That is kind of yes. They're just supposed to be kind of. Be kind of interested. Great. All going well, I think. Yes. Thank you. I ask about the environmental thing because at some point, uh, so we have sixty member organisations and. They're all very interested in COP, obviously, at the end of the year. And so at some point in the very near future, they will need to write something about their current trade trends and what the likely implications are for, for that. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of thinking about the environmental goods agreement, but also... You would have been interested in some of the discussion in the, the earliest uh, OK. Earlier I mean, session. I know Sam and Emmanuel. <laughs> um, and, uh, They are sort of very well informed, far better than, than me about that aspect of it, because I suppose my, my background is, is primarily um, UK and, and EU and, and 
environmental or the sense of uh, pollution control law, some edge conservation or planning issues. It's not a traditional portfolio of subjects, whereas a lot of this is, is new and more globally okay. orientated with the questions that have been raised. Uh, uh, we're, we're moving up a level. You know, where we've been working is national environmental law, regional okay. environmental law. This is transatlantic, which is heading towards mm -hmm. a kind of global approach to the, to the issue. Uh, you know, the considerations are um, different. I'm not off my sort of uh, comfort okay, zone okay. As, as, as regards to that area. Yeah, yeah. So it's, but it's been really good, really informative. Um, and, um, everyone's been contributing lots of questions. So it's very where, where, are you, where are you from now, Ruth? Are you sort of UK based? Or? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I, I live in Bristol, but um, the trade just is very based in London. Right, so you're commuter or something? I spend three days a week in London. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, it's good to what you feel about based on chat, we've been quite often up here for different meetings and I'm just glad I don't do it every day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not, I mean, and really the, the cost of doing what I do is nothing compared to the cost of actually living here. Yeah. Well, that's so it. If you, did, if you did want to live here, I mean, I mean, um, in my case, it's a terrible state of uh, finance. Uh, so then you hope that maybe the, the election will Cause the extortion, some promises about what needs to be done to provide basic accommodation. I don't get the amount of somebody your age, your generation, <laughs> and realise just how fortunate uh, we, we've been with the parents' generation. You know, but so so um, we're here, aren't we? Um, there are some stragglers. Do you want to give it just one last shout out and say we're, yeah. we're about to start? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to speak at the podium? Yeah. I'll just say a few words. Yeah. Uh, ladies and uh, uh, gentlemen, if I can uh, reconvene. Uh, this uh, second session of the uh, morning. I hope it's been a, an informative, useful, nourishing kind of coffee uh, uh, break, but um, we must uh, try and proceed with the, the main programme of events. The story so far is that we think uh, that trade is, is a good thing. It helps prosperity in its different forms, subject to the concern that it is trade which is ethically acceptable and environmentally sustainable. That seems to be the crunch uh, question, and we've heard various speakers before who have given us different perspectives on that. I'm very pleased to introduce our next uh, speaker, Ruth Bergen, who again I think is going to provide uh, a barometer of the ethics of this. She works, she is the coordinator, I should say, of the trade justice movement and network campaigns for socially and environmentally sustainable global trade. Exactly what we want to hear about after doing uh, various things involving volunteering in India and uh, uh, a project officer for Oxfam. She's coordinator of this movement. She says uh, she has a passion, she is passionate about issues of global justice. Sounds like exactly the right person to be speaking us to, to us today. So thank you very much. They, they stole that um, outline of who I am off a uh, a website without asking me, but it's my fault because I was supposed to provide a synopsis and I forgot. Um, anyway, so I don't have a presentation either, I'm afraid, so it's just me and a bit of paper, which is kind of not very technologically advanced. Um, so I'm going to start with a bit of a health warning, which is to say that in terms of concrete numbers and facts about the impacts on third countries, there's very little out there and very little of it is very reliable. Of course, we're talking about TTIP. These are negotiations and they're ongoing, but we have no real clear picture about what's going into the deal. So it's actually really hard to know with any kind of uh, sort of 
sense of confidence what's gonna, what, what the impact on third countries is going to be. Um, and even if there was a whole body of research about this, this area, it's likely to have been based on what we call um, computer-generated equilibrium models, which you might have heard about in the previous session and which we are highly critical of. And if you want to see some of the critiques, I'd advise you look at uh, the people from Manchester who used to run the models and who have now uh, said that they're, they're deeply flawed and can outline the reasons for that. Um, so, having told you that we're not quite sure what the facts of this are, I'm going to attempt to persuade you that, nevertheless, we should really be thinking about the impact of this trade deal um, on countries beyond those that are actually involved in the negotiations. So, five reasons why I think we should be looking at this. The first, the size of the deal. So, that people have probably talked about this in the previous session. This is a deal that's going to cover 50% of global trade. Um, and, it's going to, and that means that what it will do first is create a huge precedent in terms of what global trade deals look like. So if you're, let's say, India, who are in the throes of negotiating a deal with the EU, once TTIP goes through, the EU is going to say, oh, hang on a minute, we've got all this stuff with the US, we need all that to be in your trade deal as well. And the, the chances that India are able to resist this are fairly small once you've covered 50% of global trade already. There's also going to be huge pressure from within countries. So irrespective of whether they're negotiating deals with the EU or the US, their companies are highly likely to be engaged in trades with the EU and the US. So if you're involved in manufacturing car parts in Indonesia, for example, and you know you have to conform with EU and US standards on those car parts, it's much easier for you if your own country says, we're going to apply that across the board. It means that your competition uh, domestically is reduced. So the pressure is going to come both from the global trade picture, from the kinds of trade deals that people um, are negotiating. Um, it's also going to come from uh, domestic companies. And you might say, well, what's the problem with that? What, what's the problem with raising standards, with TTIP being used as a way of, of raising standards? Um, if third countries can benefit, for example, um, from what the, what, what's called mutual recognition. So this is where the EU and the US agree that their standards are equivalent. They could apply that then to the third countries who are uh, exporting into the EU and the US. Um, uh, and everyone could benefit. So the EU could say, yep, Indonesian car parts, they meet our standards. And the, EU, and the US would then say, um, because the EU um, has, has passed those, we'll do the same without having to run a whole series of, of checks. OK, so that, that, could be, that could work quite well. That could reduce costs. The thing is, nobody's calling for that. So the EU has explicitly said that, that they're not going to push for that. Um, they don't want what they call erga omnes uh, mutual recognition, which is where mutual recognition applies beyond the borders. They want it just to apply to companies within the EU and the US. And what that means in practice is that EU and US companies trading between, so trading transatlantically, are going to have a huge advantage as compared with other manufacturers outside of those two trading blocks trying to trade into them. Um, and when we sort of raise this with civil servants in our conversations with them, what they say is, oh, no, 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 that would be way too complicated. No, no, we couldn't possibly talk about that. I mean, this is the tr biggest trade deal we've ever seen, covering the largest number of topics we've ever seen, but it's far too complicated to try and make it uh, have a kind of beneficial impact to countries outside of the deal. The other reason why th this issue of standards I is a problem is because it, would force it, it forces countries to put resources into areas that might not be a priority for them. So if you're Indonesia, you might at some point want to raise your standards in respect of your car manufacturing, but it might not be the first thing you want to do. And you might want to prioritise your resources into other areas like health or financial regulation or who knows, into developing new industries that are going to uh, cause huge amounts of pollution. But what this does is, is really push them into a position where they have to choose between uh, improving regulation, improving standards in their car parts industries, for example, um, or investing in other sectors. And finally, the big danger that we see um, with this is, is that standards are raised not because they have a public benefit, but to protect uh, to protect as a, as a sort of trade protection mechanism. And you see this with um, EU regulations in respect of nuts, for example. So nuts, if nuts um, are not 
properly stored and transported, they can develop um, aflatoxins, which can be very toxic. Um, and so the EU raises its standards, but it's got to the point where it's raising the standards so high that it's hard to see that this is actually uh, an issue of public health um, and, and looks much more like an EU, the EU attempting to uh, protect its own manufacturers. Second reason why I think we should be thinking about the impact of TTIP on third countries. The EU and the US have said that they want this to be a deal that can be multilateralized. So they want it to be a deal that can bring other countries in, right? So they're saying they want to do this. It seems like a fairly obvious reason for me why we, we'd be looking at what the impact might be. But what this means is that the, the world's richest trading nations want to decide trade between themselves and then invite everyone else in. And of course, the UK government says, this is great because we're only going to agree really good things in TTIP. So, you know, then everyone else can just join in. That'll be good, won't it? Well, there are a few problems with that. There have been huge debates within the WTO, the World Trade Organization, about, um, about what global trade rules should look like. And usually it's the EU and the US pitched against um, developing countries as well as the BRICS, or including the BRICS. Um, so the WTO says, for example, that trade deals must cover substantially all trade. It doesn't say what that means, so it's up to the trading partners to decide what that means. The EU and the US think it means really nearly all trade, 80, 90 more, uh, 80, 90 or more percent of trade. The extent of coverage is, is really broad uh, in TTIP. So a huge range of topics covering agricultural market access, electronic commerce, energy and raw materials, financial services, chemicals, automotives, I mean, the list goes on. Um, and the focus is very much on behind the border, on, on the kind of regulations that you have in country that might affect trade. Whereas deals that are negotiated, for example, with African, Caribbean and Pacific countries tend to have a much more limited scope and they exclude a significant number of the provisions that we're seeing in TTIP. So one of them that you may have heard of is the investment protection provision, ISDS, which is the thing that allows companies to sue countries. Um, if you haven't been talking about that already, do ask me more about it at the end. Um, the deal also explicitly targets other countries. So in some leaked documents that we've seen, um, they talk about disciplining state-owned enterprises. Now, you still have a few state-owned enterprises in the EU and the US. We have the BBC, you know, one or two others. But the big home of the state-owned enterprise is, of course, China. And that's explicitly who they're targeting, right? So they want to make it really difficult for China to hang on to its state-owned enterprises. But this has huge implications for countries in, play, in, in, um, in Africa and in, in, on other continents who also use state-owned en enterprises as a really important part of their economic policy mix as they develop their economies. So setting that global precedent about state-owned enterprises could be really damaging as could the inclusion of an investment protection chapter. So this is the chapter, as I was saying, where a company gets to sue a country if a policy measure threatens their investment. So the example you may have heard of is Philip Morris are currently suing Uruguay because Uruguay wanted to introduce plain packaging on cigarette packets. And Philip Morris says that this is an infringement of its intellectual property rights, its patent rights. Um, so that's the kind of provision that you want to include, that the negotiation, negotiators want to include in the world's biggest trade deal. Um, very hard to resist including that um, in, other, in other deals. And, and what this ignores is that many countries are looking at alternative ways of offering the same provision. So Norway has said, no thanks, no more bilateral investment treaties. Uh, Australia has said, we're, not going to, we're only going to look at uh, um, investor-to-state dispute settlement on a case-by-case -case basis. Ecuador have run an audit. South Africa have a different model. India, I mean, the, the list of, of alternatives and, and the, the sort of mounting concern about these issues um, it is long. Um, and so to include it in TTIP it, it, it is potentially very damaging. Third reason for uh, considering the impact on other countries, back in the 1990s, the late 90s, early 2000s, we were told that what we needed was a trade deal, a, a global trade deal um, aimed at supporting development goals. This was the Doha round of negotiations within the WTO. 14 years later, we're still waiting for that agreement. 
and using sort of big trade deals to, to sew up global trade between the biggest, the world's biggest trading blocks really undermines that commitment to achieving um, development goals using trade. Um, and this is clear because the, the development priorities, the trading priorities of developing countries are completely absent, both from TTIP, but also when you look at things like the text coming out of the G8, um, they completely ignore the priorities that, that developing countries have put forward, things like uh, getting rid of damaging agricultural subsidies, um, the ability to, to stockpile food in case of um, food shortages, uh, climate adaptation, um, things like that, all, all absent from some of the big trade deals. And it, it's really interesting to note that BRICS, so the BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, um, are completely absent from the three big trade deals that we're seeing. So there's a Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, um, TTIP, but also then a Trade and Services Agreement, which I'll leave you to go and uh, look up. All of them exclude BRICS. And, and these are the people who were most uh, successful in resisting EU and US demands within the WTO. Fourth reason why I think we need to be thinking about um, third countries. There's some concrete evidence, again, with the health warning that I mentioned earlier, that there'll be trade diversion away from developing countries as a result of TTIP. And the best study or the most comprehensive study on this com was commissioned by DFID, um, uh, undertaken by Sussex University. It looks at 43 of the world's poorest countries, and it says that all of them experience reductions in exports to the EU and the US as a result of TTIP. Now, the percentages are small. So it's 0.5% reduction to the US and 0.1% to the EU, right? That doesn't sound like a whole lot. But the thing was, I thought where we were heading for with Doha was a trade deal that benefited developing countries, not one that went, oh, well, you know, a bit of a reduction. That's all right, isn't it? That's not what I thought we were aiming at. Um, and we know that things like climate change, Ebola, um, unfair trading practices that exist at the moment are already hitting country economies really hard. So it seems to me really ridiculous to just say, well, we'll accept a little bit of a, a negative impact. The other reason why I think we have to think hard about this is that whilst the study says kind of generally the impacts won't be too bad, when you look at the specifics, when you look at the specific countries and the specific sectors, um, the impacts are quite big. So Niger, for, is, for example, sees a 12% reduction in its exports to the US. Malawi sees a 3% reduction. All of those are really significant for those countries. And the sectors most likely to be hit are the ones that are most important for developing countries. So agriculture, textiles and footwear and so on. Um, for example, in Pakistan, they're talking about a loss of $42 million to their garment sector. Um, and just given what I said about the shakiness of these studies, and that study is, is a predictive one, so it's based on a, a lot of assumptions about what might go in the deal, um, but there is evidence from other trade deals that trade diversion does indeed happen. So a study of the Australia-US free trade agreement found trade diversion uh, of about $53 billion away from Southeast Asian uh, economies. And again, so the, the UK will say to us, well, you know... Um, Trade diversion, that's okay because the, glo the rate of global growth that we'll see from TTIP is so huge that that will all be sort of swept away and, you know, that'll deal with that. But actually, if you look at the global economy, if you look at where we are now, I mean, if you, if you want that to happen, you have to create additional demand. And what we certainly don't have at the moment is additional demand, right? We, we have, I mean, in the EU, we have potentially shrinking economy. So final reason why I think we need to be thinking about this, policy coherence for development. It's, it's uh, something that the EU politicians have said they're committed to, and what it means is that when we develop new policies at an EU level, we check to see what the impact is on developing countries, right? So EU politicians have told us that they want to do this, so I think we should hold them to that. And a deal like TTIP has a huge sticker on it that says, this might have a bit of an impact on developing countries. It's international, developing countries trade into the EU and the US. Um, we might want to think about that. So that's another reason why I, I, I think we should be thinking about it. And it's of note that the EU's own sustainability impact assessment 
due out November, 2000, uh, November 2014 will now not be available until December 2015, which happens to also be the time when they originally said they wanted to conclude the negotiations, right? So great bit of sort of uh, taking, um, looking at developing country impacts there. So what do we want? Um, we think that we should be prioritising multilateralism. That's where everybody gets to say what they think the trade system should look like. And this isn't a plea for the WTO because we think the WTO has a lot of problems, but it's a plea for a, a, a multilateral system that really prioritises um, the needs of the poorest countries. But since TTIP's a bit of a juggernaut and uh, whilst we'd really like to stop it, and maybe we will, um, there are also some things that could be done in the context of TTIP uh, to improve things. There needs to be more research about what the impacts are going to be, particularly on the country, at a country and, and, and sector level, and at the very least work to make sure that we're mitigating for negative impact. And who knows, maybe we'll find a way to make to, to, to sort of have, have some kind of positive impact, and sort of shape this to, to, to kind of have a po positive impact on developing countries. We need the sustainability impact assessment in time to be able to use it. This has to be able to inform negotiators' positions. We need one now, and then we need to be looking at another one uh, once the details of the, the deal are agreed. We also need to look beyond goods. So a lot of the assessments look only at the impact on goods. And since developing countries want to um, diversify their economies, we need to be looking at what the impact on other sectors will be. We have to hold the EU to its commitment under policy coherence for development. Um, there are a number of things that could happen within the EU. So for example, um, making its trade preference schemes um, more generous. So the EU has a thing called everything but arms, which allows least developed countries to export into the EU um, with it, no tariffs. Um, that could be extended to a, a, a gr greater number of developing countries, which would help them achieve some of their um, policy goals. And finally, um, we could start reducing or we could complete uh, the reductions in agricultural subsidies that have been promised for so long under the WTO and have been such a big priority for developing countries. Thank you. Um, th thanks uh, tremendously for, for a, a stimulating talk. Uh, the, the surprising thing, that the message that comes home to me is the massive implications of uh, tip on third countries, developing countries, poorer countries, and yet their, their lack of any stake, any involvement in the negotiating uh, process. There seems to be some kind of democracy deficit going on there. Uh, questions from the floor, please. There's a gentleman raising his hand up, up, up there. We'd like to give you a name, uh, affiliation, please. Hi, uh, now, my name is uh, Iago. Iago. I'm a student here. Now, I just uh, want to ask you, talking about the impact on the uh, third world countries in terms of uh, the reduction in the the trade that they're they're going to have, like with the first world. But isn't uh, what affects uh, the most, like what hinders their develop development most, the uh, subsidies, the agricultural subsidies in the first world, in European Union, United States, Japan, so forth? that uh, not only keep food more expensive here, but also, you know, prevent like a multi-billion dollar market that could develop there and could have like investment and, uh, you know, superior like uh, agricultural uh, technology and everything. What do you, th what do you think? One question at a time. Is it? <laughs> yes. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, thanks, yeah. I mean, and as I said, one of our big demands is that the EU and US address particularly agricultural subsidies um, but there are a range of other I mean uh, the EU is about to or has just eliminated um, sugar quotas and this is going to be a, a disaster for sugar producers across the world and it's it's quite a complicated issue because um, to some extent the, the kind of history of sugar production in developing countries has its links to colonialism uh, and to the kind of post-colonial push um, for developing countries to be exporters of raw materials. So what you have is a situation where we've told developing countries to export raw materials. Um, we have used our trade tariffs to prevent them from adding value to that. So you can produce your sugar, but if you uh, make it into sweets, you're going to hit tariffs 
um, that are much higher and going to make it much more difficult for you to export. Um, we've also then subsidised our own industry. So, yes, there are many other things that need to be addressed, but I think layering on top of that a trade deal um, that diverts further trade away from developing countries can, can only be a bad thing. Time for another brief question. There's a lady at the back here. I just wanted to comment on, on this, but I find always very fascinating is that the UK um, is able to take this international view on things and looking at developing countries, but the problems on the ground are uh, the same for European citizens. And I just wanted to kind of comment and, and initiate this kind of attempt to uh, see that the problems for citizens, um, for ordinary citizens, are very equal around the globe, meanwhile. And uh, that then it's really need to link both problems. That you don't look at the EU as a block, which is kind of uh, universal <laughs> and just has a universal reach, but uh, really see all these differences. And uh, I just wanted to uh, mention there's a lot of fantastic measurement of impacts uh, within the EU. So Austria and also Germany are very active in opposing these trade deals and have done a lot of fantastic research, which works for the EU, but it would be interesting to kind of connect this to these international development issues. That's just one. I don't know whether that needs a, a yeah, reply. I mean, I mean um, we, we work on, so we work with others um, on, on TTIP and um, we look at the impact on the EU and US as well as um, sort of beyond beyond those two groups. Um, I guess the I was asked to talk about the impact on developing countries, um, which is why I focused on, on that. Um, but I think I mean I think for sure we one of the things about trade and the thing that's very interesting about TTIP is that it's almost it's probably the first time that we've been um, on the receiving end of a trade deal that could have a lot of really serious implications for us and I think that's a reason why we think we can sort of build on that and hopefully um, generate even more solidarity with communities across the world who are fighting exactly the same things that we're now faced with in a much more kind of immediate way. Yeah. I think the point was well made there but you know, there's another level below states of individuals as well and they haven't really featured perhaps as prominently as they should do in the discussion. Final quick question. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, if I understood you correctly um, earlier, uh, yeah, a, a big one. Yes. Yeah. Um, Jim Rowland uh, here independently. Um, you're talking about uh, BRICS countries in particular being uh, um, sidelined by the TTIP process. Um, what What would you say if um, someone complained? Well, um, um, Putin's not a very nice guy. Uh, um, why are you trying to be his friend? Um, I, I'm not. The, the human rights, human rights concerns, are, are, and, and so on about some of those countries. I, I mean, I think, kind of, my perspective is that within the WTO, the most powerful group in terms of balancing out what the EU and the US ask for has been the BRICS. Um, I'm not advocating for. Putin or for, you know, or, or any sort of a supporter for the, the kind of approach to human rights that they've been taking, absolutely not. But it's, it's about who gets to decide on a world stage. Um, and, and ideally, I think you would be taking into account the needs of the majority of the world rather than just two small trading blocks who have very particular interests and who have very strong uh, kind of um, um, strong sectors that they're seeking to protect in terms of this trade deal. Okay. Um, we must call a uh, halt there. I'd, I'd like to thank Ruth for um, a passionate presentation and I think you've done a very good job of highlighting the issues of um, <coughs> countries, developing countries. So thank you very much. Ruth. <laughs> Um, it's a special uh, privilege uh, next to uh, if you have to come forward.
for to invite our, our keynote speaker to the, the podium to the uh, lectern. The, the, wor the world of environmental law is quite a small one. You know, there are some number of people who are sort of specialist in the area, and I've, I've met most of them uh, over the years, but I've never had the privilege of um, recognize, uh, meeting Professor Augustus Sadler, but I, I feel I kind of know him through some of his really important publications as a, uh, a weighty text on uh, EU environmental principles, which is compulsory reading for all my postgraduate students, and there's a more recent work on training the EU. So we really are uh, very privileged to have one of the leading lights in the European environmental law world speak to us today and I'm sure he can uh, draw some penetrating and Im important insights from his extensive knowledge of EU trade law. If you want to use the, the lectern, please do. Please do. Thank you. Sorry, I should have added the, uh, the information about your affiliations. Oh. Yes, uh, UCL is uh, not University uh, College London, it's uh, Université Catholique de Louvain, uh, also among one of the oldest uh, universities on this continent. Um, well, it's a great pleasure uh, to speak for the second time um, to this audience. I was invited already two years ago, uh, but my uh, a speech focused on the six-pack and the forthcoming two-pack and the uh, austerity measures uh, entailed uh, by this uh, broad range of um, uh, regulations. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, not only the ministries of culture of uh, Italy and Greece were hit uh, by the um, uh, austerity uh, flowing from uh, the, the need to stabilize uh, national deficits and national budget, but uh, as a matter of fact also ministries uh, of uh, environmental protection have been suffering quite a lot uh, in losing their budget or in curtailing their budget and their number of civil servants. And actually what we do see all across Europe from west to east, from north to south, uh, is that um, environmental ministries are far less efficient than they used to be 10 years ago uh, on the account that they are not endowed with the same level of resources. Uh, I shall um, address the trade uh, and environmental debate uh, from an EU perspective, but uh, listening to the former uh, speaker, I will try to reconnect uh, my uh, speech to former comments. Um, of importance is to stress that uh, at the outset uh, in 1957 um, the uh, issue of environment protection or the issue of uh, health or food safety uh, were absent from the former treaty on the European economic communities. Uh, through a number of reforms, <laughs> environmental concerns as well as a number of other concerns have gradually been able to establish themselves as key par parameters, as key values uh, enshrined into the constitutions of the EU. So and so forth, uh, in virtue of Article 3, Paragraph 3 of the Treaty on the European Union, um, environmental protection um, is placed upon equal footing with the internal market, uh, sustainable development has been set forth uh, and sustainable development entails a balanced economic growth with a high level of environment protection and also social uh, integration. And this is the basis uh, of the whole uh, legal order uh, that prevails over 28 national legal orders. Besides that, and that's one of the key differences with World Trade Organization legal system as well as the forthcoming TTIP is that the success of the EU in half a century has been reckoning upon the ability, the empowerment of a broad range of institutions to enact harmonized legislations. So EU won't be looked at 
from a, an African or South American perspective as a success story in case it was not endowed with that ability to enact secondary legislations. And so, um, so far, uh, uh, EU environmental law uh, succeeded in encompassing the main forms, not all forms of pollution, and to maintain and to protect as well um, a number of key ecosystems, but not all uh, ecosystems. Um, that policy, and as well as environmental law, because that policy has been framed ever since uh, into a legal approach, uh, yielded to a number of successes, ranging from the banning of lead uh, in petroleum products, uh, phasing out at a much um, faster speed uh, ozone depleting substances than uh, the speed with which they have been uh, banned uh, on uh, in uh, other continents. Uh, limitation from na nitrogen oxides, um, really a s improvement of waste water treatment all across the continent, a reduction of acidification that was a very severe problem in the early 70s establishment of natural tools on network that's really been enhancing nature production all across the continent and also improvement of parts of some aspects of air quality. But well, that's also one of the contradictions of this environmental policy that's also uh, uh, prompting the development of new energy that can be placed in uh, virgin uh, land that are uh, of uh, interest uh, for bird species this is close to Teruel uh, in uh, Navarra in Spain, um, prime hotspots for a number of uh, endangered uh, steppe species. So one clearly understands also the contradiction to uh, enhance uh, such uh, environmental approach. But that being said, the omens are unfortunately not that too good. Uh, the EU is still facing a daunting agenda of unfinished business. Uh, many of the European Commission reports so far have been stressing that uh, the objectives regarding waste management, regarding the diminution of hazardous substances into waters, uh, bios biodiversity conservation targets have not been achieved and are not going to be achieved in the very near future. Um, in addition to this, uh, European cities um, last 10 days ago have been struggling with a very high level of uh, fine particles pollution. That was the case uh, of uh, the capital of Belgium, Brussels, uh, where we reach uh, 80 um, microgram of um, uh, fine particles uh, for a day without the public being apprised of the matter. What a shame. But uh, adding to this, we do face extremely serious uh, challenges with respect in particular to climate change. Um, I've been spending the last few days to look at the different uh, IPCC reports and the, we face an accumulation of evidence. The evidence is strengthening, not regarding exclusively the cause and uh, effect relationship between the emissions of greenhouse gases, but also regarding the cascade of impacts uh, the rise of temperature uh, might uh, entail. And so, uh, as you're aware, the uh, EU uh, targets that were uh, endorsed by the European Council in Brussels uh, last uh, September are uh, falling short uh, of uh, meeting a high level of um, climate change uh, policy objectives, according to many scientists. It's not enough, uh, but nonetheless, it's much better than the American objectives that were proposed a week ago, uh, where the benchmark is not the year 1990, but the benchmark is the year 2005. Why 2005? Because that's where the U.S. hit the highest level of emissions of greenhouse gases in their history. So that means that in achieving a 30% reduction against the 2005 benchmark, it means that Americans have to commit, or American companies will have to commit far less than European undertakings. But the question is 
free trade the issue, and, and I, I concurred with the <coughs> opinion of uh, Mr. Uh, Stowe uh, that it depends what kind of trade, what, what are we trading in, uh, what kind of uh, economy we try to uh, foster. Uh, economic growth at all costs, and everybody is aware of that in London at least, uh, is resulting in greater pressures on ecosystems. So plenty of scientific studies demonstrating that a higher exploitation of natural resources, higher consumption of services and products is actually leading to the deteriorations of a key ecosystems. But coming to the 